Hey everybody, welcome back to episode 2 of the Weekly History Chaos Podcast. I want to tell you, everyone who's came back from episode 1, thank you. And for those new that are maybe checking out episode 2, this is a history-based podcast where I draw random topics that I've pre-selected from a bucket. And we talk about these topics. Um, they could be anything from World War II, primarily World War II right now. It's just an easy topic for me to talk about. I know it really in depth. I have to like look up a bunch of information. Um, it's not something that I really have to, uh, I guess, worry about on that. But if anyone does have any interesting topics or anything that they would like me to talk about, please email me. You can email me at jdcarson93 at gmail.com. You can send me any kind of topic request you'd want me to talk about on the podcast. Or you can reach out to me through my TikTok channel, which is where I primarily make content. Uh, my YouTube channel. Both of these are called Das Bear. That's D-A-S-S-B-E-A-R. Um, I also have a Twitch and some other things going on. But you can reach out to me anywhere you can find me. If you have any ideas for topics or if you would like to be a guest on the show, I am actively looking for other people who are interested in history that would love to be a guest on the show and talk about some of these subjects and topics with me. But uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and draw our first topic for the day and we can talk about it and see what we pull. I actually got asked the other day, uh, you know, why, why I want to do a history podcast and pretty much why I want to do it this way. And the really reason, the big reason is, is one, history is what I'm passionate about. I've, I've always loved history. I've con I mean, I'll read stuff about history just for no reason because I enjoy it. Now, when it comes to the reason why I do it like this is the number one complaint I hear about history and for people who say they don't like it is it becomes very monotonous. History is usually delivered in formats of chronological order based off date and time and what happened then and what happened next. And uh, having things delivered that way, like constantly, it, it, it becomes monotonous. People stop getting engaged with the content, stop really paying attention, and it becomes boring for them. And so with this, hopefully with drawing topics and changing what I'm talking about a lot and giving a personal insight of how I feel about things, maybe it'll get someone interested in a type of history that they wasn't interested in before. But enough to talk about myself. <laughs> First uh, card I drew here is Tech Advancements of World War II, which is a really cool subject. So, obviously, war is not good. Um, I don't ever condone that, you know, oh, let's go to war or anything like that. War is not good, but I will say this. War does lead to technological advancements in medical warfare, everything, industry, because it gives people a driving reason to progress, just like... Uh, radio technology, radar technology, everything that advanced so much more during World War II. Um, the first radio-controlled bomb made by Germany. Very cool thing. I mean, none of this was made. There was even a uh, radio-controlled uh, a mine, radio-controlled mine, the Goliath Mines, actually in the new uh, Call of Duty Vanguard game. Um, but you could, they would actually use those mines, and they could radio-control them, drive them underneath enemy tanks, and, and blow them up. So it's a pretty cool uh, historical fact on that. Uh, another technological advancement. Well, really, just medical. Uh, if you think about it, like just medical advancement, because you look at like the death rates of World War One, and like fifty percent of death rates from the First World War were from uh, disease and uh, getting sick and like uh, being in the trenches. I mean, like it was. It's really weird that uh, there's such a high death rate at that time period from from getting sick. I mean, that, that's really what it's from. Uh, but if you look at like World War II, it really drops down because modern medicine is caught up. Med medicine gets better. Technology improves. Another thing that is not exactly a good thing, but the V-2 rocket. I mean, the V-2 rocket is, it's a fan, it's, it was a terrible weapon, but it was, a, it was a fantastic creation because at that time, no one really thought about like, yeah, let's send a rocket way, like this far path away, you know, hundreds of miles. You know, no one thought about doing that at that time. And that V-2 rocket led to the space race. I mean, and the V-1 rocket was essentially what a cruise missile is, like the earliest form of cruise missile. Like, that's really what a V-1 rocket is. But a V-2 rocket, full-size rocket, I mean, this is what really gave people the idea of, like, we could go to space, you know, we, we could have... Oh, and then with nuclear weapons being produced, you know, uh, the technology to, to launch those nuclear weapons was going to be developed. But yeah, it led to the space race. I mean, V-2 rocket was a big thing. Um, there was a big scramble for it. Russians were looking for V-2 rocket sites whenever they came close to Berlin. Uh, the Allies, the moment they got into France, they were looking for them. I mean, they, this this is like something, this was number one priority, one of this technology. Uh, what do we think of other, there has to be some other advancements. Um, 
ships, naval tanks. I mean, just travel uh, engines. What 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 engines could support weight? I mean, think about like an engine that could support a vehicle that weighed a hundred tons. I mean, that's just unbelievable. Like the the things that they were coming up with at that time period. Maybe not well, but you know they were they were putting in the effort to come up with these uh, planes, like jets. Like again, back to rocket, like jet aircraft, like getting produced. I mean, you see, like the end of the war. I mean, Germany made a jet aircraft. The U.S. made a jet aircraft. Uh, the UK made a jet aircraft. I mean, all at the end of the war, and the fact that like all this technology really stems from just if without the effort of war, maybe driving it, there probably wouldn't have been as much of a reason for people to like we got to make rockets as fast as we can. Uh, and the other thing was advancement. Uh, it came with advancement, came a better world, but it also came. Uh, it really saved everyone because of the Great Depression at the time advancement led to a more secure and economic future for the world. And that's pretty much all I can think of right now. I'm sure later I'll, I'll think of like something else advancement wise technology in World War II that I should have been like, Oh man, I should have mentioned that. Uh, but that's, that's all I can think of right now. So a lot of things they learned that didn't work in World War II advancement wise. Let's go ahead and draw another topic. See what we get next. I know everything is in here, but I don't know what order I will draw them in. And I have not prepared what I would say about any of these. Alt history World War II. I left this one very generic, very openly broad. That way I could talk about anything with it. Uh, but alt history. Let me think of the first things I think of. Uh, first thing I think of would be like, I mean, what if the mustache man never came to power in Germany? Like, what? what how would the world be with... With Germany, because the Communist Party was actually growing in Germany at that time period, and he kind of came through with you know with his own, which fascism, being a fascist fashion, that that's a that's a a version of communism. Like a lot of people don't say that, but like be like, oh, you're a riot, you're a fat. It's it's a version of communism, is what that is. But it would have been really interesting because probably Germany would become a communist nation. It, it would either would have stayed the same or not. So there's a lot of options there. Other alt history, if Dunkirk would have been lost, like if Germany would have actually, instead of focusing on going to Paris and, you know, accepting the in the surrender and everything, if if Germany would have said, you know, we're going to take these guys out of Dunkirk, uh, game over. I mean, there's there's no way that the UK could have fought after that. Uh, other alt history would have been if the Hawaii raid went correctly. I mean, if, if Hawaii got... If more, first off, our carriers were near Hawaii and they actually got taken out along with the battleships, uh, that would have been GG in the Pacific for, like, decades, probably, because we, we would have been so far behind. And it gave the Japan Japan enough breathing room to figure out what they were going to do next. I mean, that, that's the honest truth. Other alt history would be if, like, uh, Japan never did attack us. Like, you know, would we... Would the U.S. ever go into World War II? Like, I mean, we were giving supplies, but would, it, would we ever directly, without being attacked... Would we ever politically be able to enter World War II? And that's a great question because at the time, I would say no. If you look at it, because I mean, like, I mean, whenever the bombing of Pearl Harbor happened, there was a lot of anger in the U.S., like a lot of anger and sentiment against uh, Japanese people, but mainly Asian people in general. I don't know if you've ever uh, listened to or read up on the pretty much. I don't say I want to call them camps, but a lot of Asian people that. Maybe were related to Japanese people, Japanese citizens. I mean, a lot of them were rounded up into camps, especially toward the West Coast. And they were kept there because there was such hostility and they thought they could be spies. And just overall opinion of, of Asian people at that time dropped at a very, very low point. Kind of a messed up period, but if we never entered the war, Japan never attacked Pearl Harbor, the world could be very different. Japan might have controlled all the Pacific but where we control, like not our areas, but the rest, because I don't believe that India, everyone else in the area, I don't really believe they could have stood up to Japan. And if we never enter the war, I imagine that means that UK and stuff, I, mean, there, I don't know, there, there's a lot of things that could have happened. Maybe we wouldn't have, I'm not going to say Germany could have won the war, but I feel like Soviet Union would have won the war, which would mean that we lost the war because, I mean, right after the World War II ends, Cold War starts. You know, and that, that we would not be in a good position. The Cold War ended the way it did evenly because the world was split pretty evenly. If the world's not split evenly, it might the Cold War could have went to a hot war pretty quick. 
Let me think here. Mm, Battle of Moscow, Stalingrad. I mean, there, there's a lot of alt history. I do a good alt history. Uh, if da if Danzig actually Danzig Danzig, I think I'm saying that right. Danzig and Poland. If D Poland would have gave up Danzig, like I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. If they would have gave it up to Germany, and Germany would never had war with them, they would just gave up that area and these lands that Germany wanted. And then uh, when Soviet Union requested their lands from eastern Poland, and if Poland refused that, Germany might have helped Poland, possibly. Or let Poland succumb to its fate, who knows. Or or the Allies might have... There might have been a war, the big World War II might have been against Soviet Union at that point. Or possibly Germany could have let me USR cartridges attack Poland. All I know is that the Allies probably never went to war with Germany, and Germany would eventually have definitely fought the Soviet Union. And it would have just been a war between those two nations, most likely. And whatever minor nations allied with Germany, and whatever minor nations allied with Soviet Union at the time. But it wouldn't have been what I would call a world war. It probably would have had an actual name for that war. That's all I can think of for alt history at the moment. So we're going to go ahead and draw another topic. I don't know about y'all, but it has been a long, long day. Uh, a long weekend and a short weekend at the same time. And uh, I'm happy to, I guess, have a regular week this week. Last week was kind of like hectic. I don't know. I can't. The people on the podcast ain't going to see it. And probably the people in the video can't see a lot of it. But today, if you ever buy acoustic panels for your podcast, your show, anything, buy a large panel that you put on the wall. Do not buy a bunch of individual one foot panels. Because it was a pain to get these up. And hopefully, on y'all's end right now, this audio sounds a lot better. I have put more time and effort into making my audio better. And it's going to get better with every episode. So hopefully episode 2 sounds better than episode 1. And if it doesn't, you get a hold of me and let me know. But hopefully you like it more. Uh, could World War II have been prevented? Almost like an all history. But this one's kind of specific. So, World War II was caused by World War One. For you, like, say, like, well, there's a lot of other stuff, but... So, the main reason World War II was caused was because at the end of World War One, which the U.S. entered into uh, a little late into that war, but we still contributed, we still lost a decent number of lives, and, you know, we, we still contributed in that war. A lot of European nations do not believe that the U.S. has very much claim to World War One, but... We did participate in that war. And at the end of the war, our president at the time was, well, we were talking to the other leaders of other nations, and we were coming up with a treaty for the end of the war, the Versailles Treaty. Well, at the time, we wanted to form a, uh, and probably, I don't remember the exact name of it, but we wanted to form pretty much kind of like what the UN is now. We wanted to form a, a you know, a, a, a group of people, a group of nations, that way this war doesn't happen again. There's not a great war. And part of that was going to be the limited punishment for Germany. We're not going to put these guys in like massive debt. We're not going to make it like hard for them to, you know, move on as a nation. We're not going to make, we're not going to put them in a position to build up grudges against us. So with, without them being able to uh, build up grudges against us and everything, it would have prevented the war from ever getting as escalating because the way the Versailles Treaty is set up, I mean, it's, it's punishing. Like it, it, it punishes Germany heavily. Uh, the Great Depression is up happening. All these negative things happening. Germany's in debt. Germany owes money. Germany's people. I mean, there's a, there's a time where like you could have you know hundreds of thousands of Germany's the mark. I think it's the mark. Uh, the German money at the time to buy a loaf of bread. I mean, it, it was as poor as poor could get at one point. And a lot of this hatred was fuming in the country, and they were pointing it outwards. So they were they were mad at France. They were mad at UK. They were mad at all these nations around them that seemed to be doing better than them. You know, they're like, it's not fair that we're punished so heavily. And then uh, using that, people like the Mustache Man came to power using the the hatred of the people to his advantage to gain popularity. And then even besides that, he channeled that anger into local residents of that, of that country. He blamed Jewish people 
for the situation. He blamed, he, he blamed Jewish people in other nations and Jewish people in his nation, and but he also blamed other nations as well. He put all that hatred out there saying that it's going to be Germany first, and they're going to do all these things different. He's going to get back the, you know, he's going to get back the German way of life and the German power and German this. And he really pushed that home. I mean, it's very right-sided, very nationalist. But the Versailles Treaty enabled that to happen. So the Versailles Treaty was more forgiving, more helpful toward the Germans who also suffered during the war, just like every other nation. Then it would have been a uh, it would have been a better outcome. Probably could have avoided the war. Another way that World War II could have been prevented would have been uh, further appeasement. So instead of sorry, getting drink water. Oh, sorry, I had to hydrate, hydrate or die. But uh, instead of uh, doing appeasement and giving giving Germany nations in general, and you know our countries, you know giving back land to Germany, instead of doing that, and and then being like at one point, nope, nope, this is too far. You know, y'all, you you've taken enough. We're gonna go to war now. Instead, just keep going with the appeasement strategy. And you might say, well, if you just keep giving. They're just gonna keep taking. Most likely not true. I mean, if you look at the time period, probably would have taken. Germany would have taken. Let's say, let's say we just kept giving in, and we never went to war because of Poland. Germany would have taken Poland. Germany would have taken Austria. It already took in Czechoslovakia. It would have taken these lands, and then after taking these lands, Germany Germany would have never looked west. They would have looked east. They'd be like, "Man, we want to take out the Soviet Union," and so they either fought the Soviet Union or they, you know, and either they would have won or lost, and that's a whole other story. But it would have prevented World War II, or at least it would have delayed it to a later time period. Maybe World War II would have actually been in like 1950s or 60s. I mean, who knows? And technology might have been different as well. So there's a lot of things that could have been different there. Uh, the other way that World War II could have been prevented was by uh, by having an earlier war and preventing the scale from growing. So instead of you know letting appeasement happen, which means instead of giving Austria back to Germany when that when it first started, if the UK and France and maybe the U, maybe not the US but maybe US supplies. But if the UK and France would have gotten together and formed an army, and, you know, at that point, you know, they, they had the uh, Alessac, Lorraine, uh, the, the Maginot, the Mag, I'm going to say this wrong, the uh, Maginot Line, Maginot Line, there we go, something like that. Uh, if they had that, they had their troops right there, they had their army right there to go into Germany, and they would have told no, Germany, no, if you go into Austria, we're going to have war. And Germany probably would have done it, Germany, because at the time they would have thought, nah, they won't do it. So when they move into Austria and they're they're moving their forces, Germany's army at the time was nowhere near ready for war. They had way less tanks. They they were not prepared. Okay, like so if you would have had an early war like 1937, probably the war you would have defeated Germany extremely quick, prevented it from expanding into a world war, thus preventing World War II. So that's a couple ways, you know. You you, you do it that way, one way. Another way is, you know, just whenever someone applies to go to, to art school, you just let them into art school. That's another way World War II might have been prevented as well. So, kind of a funny one there at the end. Let's see, uh, let's see what we draw. Uh, U.S. importance in World War II. Actually, I think I have another one in here that's similar to this, and we can talk about both. I know I'm kind of cheating right now. I'm just over here drawing out the exact one I want to talk about, but there's another one that goes, it goes like so close with this one that if I don't talk about it, uh, that it's going to be uh, kind of odd. If that makes sense. Anyway, I already know what it is. It's pretty much involving the Soviet Union. It's... Uh, so this one's the U.S. importance in World War II. The other one is the so the lend lease for the Soviet Union from the U.S. to the Soviet Union in World War II. So they're both very very similar to each other. If you uh, look into them, but the U.S. importance in World War II primarily is because well, a without the U.S., Japan would have taken over the Pacific. The U.K. was not ready to fight another war other than Germany. It, the, their their puppet nations, their uh, their Commonwealth nations, probably couldn't have held held the um, held off the 
Japanese at the time. So that would have happened. Uh, the other way is, like, just everything-wise. Trade ships, naval ships, convoys, destroyers. I mean, we gave 100 destroyers to the UK. I mean, we 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 gave a lot of supplies. And because of that, you know, the U.S. does claim to give a lot. Like, they claim a lot of World War II pride, you know, back-to-back -back WW champions, you know, things like that. We claim a lot, but we really did help out a lot. I mean, if you look at the number of food, trucks, tanks, weapons, ammunition, everything we sent out, it's, it's, a, it's an astonishing amount. Um, but let's talk specifically about the Soviet Union just for a second. Um, so the Soviet Union, they uh, they need a lot. So like food wise, when the war broke out, you know, winter hit, and they were getting drove back. They're destroying stuff. Germans were taking stuff. Their people were starving. And I don't know about any army, but if you don't have food, then you cannot fight. If you don't have food, then your army dies. And that's kind of how like everything works. So they needed a ton, a ton of food, and we sent like. Tons, tons and tons and tons of food over there. Like we, we fed their population. Like we're not totally, but we fed like a good portion of their military and stuff. And on top of that, you know, even if we sent food, if the if they have no idea, no way to get food from the port to anywhere else in the country, it's not going to go anywhere. And the reason why I say that, we gave them seven hundred thousand trucks. We supplied over eighty percent of the trucks in the Soviet Union before the end of the war. That's a lot of trucks. And it's somewhere between seventy and eighty percent. But we gave them that many trucks, and that's a lot. I mean, like we we it led to their armies being able to move forward at the at the appropriate pace to maintain the war. It led to their armies not getting bogged down in bad weather, mud, snow, all these terrible conditions. It led to their armies being fed, their people being fed, people not dying, not starving. Uh, literally, our supplies. There's if we didn't deliver no supplies, none at all. Berlin, I mean Berlin, Mo Moscow and Stalingrad could have been a lot different. Um, and we took losses from this. We sent, you know, hundreds of thousands of tons, if not more than that, up north through the Arctic. And when we were doing that, I mean, submarines did attack us. So we had German subs sinking convoys. We lost about 10% of the supplies we sent that way. And that means 10% of sailors and people that are on those ships died. Or they, some of them might have died. But we took losses doing that. You know, we took that risk to support the Soviet Union because without if the Soviet Union fail, it would have been a very hard war for us. So we knew we had to support them. But the same thing everywhere. We had we escorted ships. We had we gave out convoy ships. Uh, we had factories in the U.S. that were making refrigerators, turned over to making tanks, to planes, to everything else. I mean, we were supplying the world. You look at the U.K. Army in World War II. I mean, there was entire companies and divisions using nothing but American equipment, American Tommy guns, American everything, American tanks, because they didn't have the, the British equipment. They didn't have it there. Uh, we were the piggy bank. I mean, that, that's, that's the honest truth. And without us in World War II, without us being there, it would have been a lot harder. I mean, you got to have ammo. You got to have guns. You got to have everything you need to fight, which we did gain a lot out of it. I'm not going to tell you we didn't. The U.S. gained a lot by giving it out. I mean, I think the UK just cleared their World War II debt recently just because, like, all the stuff we gave them, we asked for repayment on, and they finally just cleared it, like, within the past few years or something. It, was, it hasn't been very long. And then, uh, just overall, we just, like, we gained, I think when we gave the destroyers, we gained bases, naval bases. Uh, we gained quite a bit of bases in the Pacific because of the war with Japan. And, I mean, you look around the U.S. today, and we have bases in every country, and a lot of that's because of what we did in World War II. I mean, we're giving out tanks for a dollar. You know, we're giving out planes for a dollar. That's really cheap. I mean, it wasn't a lot of money. Um, and then we were asking for every payment. And But before you say, like, man, the U.S. just put everybody in debt, we gave, like, an 80% discount on repayment, okay? Like, we didn't, like, go them, like, yeah, we got to repay us the full amount for the cost of these. So it was, like, an 80% discount. So we, we were pretty polite and... You know, we went about it a good way. We didn't burn the people, and a lot of that discounting and stuff like that was because we were putting uh, naval bases and stuff like that, and and bases in general, and all across the world. And we've done that now to maintain world peace and to be there as a force if needed in those nations, not as a threat, but as an assistance. Especially when the Cold War went on afterwards. I mean, we we were paramount to keeping it a Cold War and not a hot war. Okay, kind of went on there a little bit further than I wanted to about Soviet Union, but uh, the, everyone kind of gets the point. I'll probably think about more later on this topic that I should have mentioned. 
but hopefully everyone enjoyed that. Uh, let's see here. Got that one already. Let's see what we drew. Oh, okay. So this one. Military classifications of World War II. And what I'm specifically talking about is what people believe as military classifications, like the common ones. I any more, like most younger people, they get all of their knowledge off World War II from like a video game or something like that. And those things are filled with inaccuracies. Like they're, they're not right. They, they do not have correct information. You know, like, oh, you know, this tank was this and this was that. And it's, it's not true. Or this plane was this. Um, the truth is on classifications, I can kind of break them down. So like back then, it's changed. Right after World War II happened, this changed. So if you look past World War II, don't quote me on any of this because it changes right after World War II. But if you look back at World War II, when it came to tanks and self-propelled guns and tank destroyers and self-propelled artillery and SPAA, you know, anti-aircraft guns that were self-propelled, the, uh, the world didn't really know how to classify these things. These are all new technologies. These are all new vehicles. They don't know you know, what, what category to put them in. What are they? You know, you know, they don't know what makes what a what, you know, at the time. They're learning. They're classifying. It's it's no different than, like, anything else, science classifications. They're trying to figure out how to label something for what it is and to make it accurate. So, like, when you look back, not everything you see that's armored is a tank. You know, if you look at a, I'm trying to think here, a, a tiger tank. That's a tank. It's a tiger. Everyone realizes that's a tank. And what makes it a tank, specifically, is a turret. One, it had a movable turret that could move around, it could rotate. So the turret moved. A turret was very important to be classified as a tank back then. So you wanted to have a turret on tank. Things that didn't have turrets, like uh, tank destroyers, for example. don't. Some tank destroyers do. A lot of tank destroyers don't have turrets. But a tank destroyer, if it was classified as that, it would not have a turret. And like a Stug 3, for example, or Stug 4. They don't have turrets. The gun is placed into the tank, and the tank would move itself to aim itself. Now, that's a tank destroyer. Now, even though the word tank is in the name, tank destroyer, it's not a tank. So that can, might confuse people. So there's two classifications for vehicles back then. And there is, and you can look all this up. So like, if you ever like quit, like wondering if I'm really accurate about this, like look it up. But there is, a, so there's tanks on your right, and then on your left, you have self-propelled artillery. Self-propelled artillery is a broad term with multiple subcategories. So tanks are, you know, heavy tank, medium tank, light tank, tankettes. Kind of break those down. That's kind of obvious what they are. Self-propelled artillery, though, you break it down. You have direct fire, indirect fire. If it's uh, it could be a, if it's a direct fire, it could be a tank destroyer, direct fire tank destroyers. Um, you could have SPAA, self-propelled AA guns. That's also self-propelled artillery. They're using the word artillery like support, so it's like self-propelled support. Um, that's another way to replace it. If it's an indirect fire, it could be a assault gun, or it could be a howitzer. Um, you know, anything like a mortar, self-propelled mortar with armor. You know, like it, there, there's a lot of things it could be to be considered that. But the only one that really throws people off is like tank destroyers. Uh, what what is it? Uh, the German uh, AA guns, the self-propelled ones. Th those would be self-propelled artillery. The German Sturm Tigers that were a big assault gun, also self-propelled artillery. Uh, any German howitzers, anything like that. If it's self-propelled and it's on a chassis, like a tank chassis, something like that, or a motor carriage, that's all self-propelled artillery. So there's there's a lot of subcategories, but when people name off like you forgot this tank destroyer, it's not a tank, you know, they get, it's it's not a tank. It's it's a tank destroyer, which is a self-propelled gun, which is a direct fire self-propelled gun, which is in self-propelled artillery category. So it's it's confusing. Um speaking of that, there's also like some other confusion on things. Like even tanks like designations were confusing. If you look at the T28, T95 that's a prime example. The U.S. made the T-28 heavy tank. And they made it, uh, I don't remember the exact year, but I think it's like 43, somewhere in there. But they made it, or maybe it's 42. They made it, and it's a very, very heavy tank. But when it was being made and it comes out, it doesn't have a turret. 
So it, the gun sticks in the front. It's a big. It's a big tank, and the gun sticks in the front. It doesn't have a turret, but it's super heavy. And it's wide, and they labeled it as a heavy tank. It's labeled wrong, by the way, but we'll get into that here in a minute. Well, after they when it was being made, they said, well, it doesn't have a turret, it doesn't rotate, so maybe it's not. Maybe we shouldn't label it as a heavy tank. Maybe we should label it as something else. And they decide to label it as a T95 uh, self-propelled gun, but they think they use gun carriage is the term the U.S. uses. So it would be a gun carriage, meaning it's it carries a gun, but I mean it's it's huge. Um, and at the time, also it had it had a dual track system, so you could have either one track on or two. Yeah, if you, the reason why I had two tracks on it was because it would disperse the weight. The tank was so heavy, it would destroy roads, destroy bridges, and it was very hard to get it around. And if you had the second pair of tracks on, it would re, it would spread that weight out over a bigger area, less damaging. And if you had one track on, it could fit on railroad, railroad cars, so you could fit it on a train. So that made it a lot easier. But then you could, so you look forward, so they called it, so they, they renamed it T95. And then after renaming it T95, in 1946, they renamed it again back to the T-28. So it's changed names now. This will be the third time. They went from T-28. They named it T-28, put it to T-95, called it a gun carriage. They bring it back to T-28, and they called it a super heavy tank and a T-28. And that's wrong. I mean, if you look it up and you really look at pictures of it and stuff, what it is, it's a super heavy tank destroyer, and that's what it is. So it really it should be labeled still as a self-propelled artillery. But I think a lot of it was like propaganda kind of reasons. Look at this big tank. You know, there's a lot of things that happen in history because of propaganda. Just because it sounds good, looks good, it, inv it invokes fear upon the enemy and, you know, honor and pride uh, among the, you know, the U.S. populace. Well, guys, that's going to be my final topic. I think I'm going to draw out. Um, I want to tell everybody thank you for listening in. Um, I, I really enjoy these. It's kind of like my favorite thing to look forward to each week. Hopefully everybody finds it interesting. If everybody could, if you're interested in being a guest, check out my email, jdcarson93. If you're interested in any of my content, look up DOSBear. It's D-A-S-S-B-E-A-R. You can find me on YouTube. You can find me on TikTok. I mean, check out my content. You can message me on there. I mean, I, I love to hear from fans. Love to hear from anybody. But if you want to be a guest, reach out to me. And if you have ideas for topics, anything I could talk about that would be of interest to me, I will give you a shout out on the show as I do it. So if you give me an idea for a topic and I draw it out, I will mention your name and tell you thank you for giving me this topic and I will talk about it. Well, that'll be everything, guys. Until next time, thank you. If it's possible, give me a good review if there's a chance to anywhere. But y'all have a great week.